Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today, we're joined by a very special guest. I present you American Renaissance Peter Griffin. So, Peter, how are you doing? Oh, I'm very good, Scott. Uh, thank you. You don't sound like Peter Griffin. What <laughs> no, is this no. shit? This is absolutely... Get off the show. I'm I was not... expecting the actual Peter Griffin, but racist. <laughs> I know, I know. Race I'm, realist, honest, I mean, actually. I'm a fraud. I'm terrible at the Peter Griffin uh, impression. So uh, crucify me, ratio me on my tweets all you want. So, you yeah. <laughs> But uh, given our topic today, I will bring out the Slavoj Zizek impression for we are discussing the anti woke left, correct? That is correct. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, Countercurrents Lois is uh, ho- helping support you right now. <laughs> 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 or maybe oh she's V-Dare, yeah. uh, Lois Griffin. <laughs> we'll have to see. But as yeah. you were saying, the main discussion topic today is, of course, the anti-woke left phenomenon. Many listeners have probably come across this term. It's a broad movement that includes everyone from Glenn Greenwald to podcasts like Red Scare and True Anon. Generally, it refers to those dissident leftists. I don't actually really like calling them dissident leftists, but they call themselves that, who think identity politics has gone too far and want a more class-focused left. I had some controversial tweets on the subject last week. I'll quote myself here, as I want to do. Anti-woke leftists are to right-wing Twitter as base blacks are to normie conservatives. And I added, the fantasy left of anti-woke leftists never existed in America. The American left has always been about, been about identity politics. See the civil rights movement. You're very familiar with the left, Peter. So was I wrong here? No, I don't think so. I think that's more or less a correct take. Um... I think that some of them are a little more positive on it, but they don't see it as the primary mode of organization that they should be doing. Um, some of them are more completely, you know, class reductionist. Uh, there is kind of a spectrum going on there. Uh, but yeah, you're you're right. I mean, uh, organizing on the, the grounds of like racial equality has always been a big focus for the left in America, especially. Um, I think that where it comes from is that there's a lot of dissonance between kind of where we expect it to be in terms of racial issues and where we are right now. Uh, obviously, everybody is always taught about uh, how America is the place of equality and we overcame slavery and uh, oppression and Jim Crow and all that. And at the end of the day, you still see a bunch of racial disparities and, and gender disparities, too, across many different uh, socioeconomic status, uh, different you know fields of occupations. And wherever you look, you can see it pr- pretty much. Um, uh, going from there, a, kind of that contradiction is, I think, what inspires a lot of the wokeness so that people realize that they have to be very aggressive in dealing uh, with racial issues so that you essentially end up treating every kind of microaggression, every kind of wrong thing to say to somebody as like the, the Holocaust, too, essentially. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I mean, everything has to come boil down to race. And I think a lot of these anti-woke leftists are relatively normal people who got into left because, well, a lot of them are millennials rather than Zoomers. They really hated George W. Bush. Uh, they didn't really like capitalism. I, I guess they're alienated from mainstream consumerism. And, and, and they have all these criticisms of a lot of our society. And so as most people who are alienated from your mainstream society, <laughs> they turn to the left, but they're not down with everything that, they, that the left is going with. I mean, they don't like, they're queasy about white privilege and depending on like who you're talking to, to on the anti woke some of them are totally down with all the racial justice issues. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, we have to deal with white privilege and we live in a white supremacist society. Others think it's more stupid and they don't like talking about it. Uh, but in general, it's they're not the freak shows of the left. They're rarely any of them are transgender. Uh, they don't have their gender pronouns. They think gender pronouns are dumb, and it's they want to make jokes that are edgy and politically incorrect. But the left like straightjackets them. I mean, most of these people are not necessarily serious thinkers. They're podcasters. They're comedians. They're not really the people who are generating the at the forefront of thought. I mean, even though Matt, some of the articles published by Jackman Magazine and other left-wing publications would be counted as anti-woke left, the general, I mean, the mainstays of it are like people like Red Scare, which is just two dumb broads 
talking about like how they hate leftist men and they wish that there was some conquering right-wing fascist to come sweep them off their feet. <laughs> and that's generally their criticism of the left is that the left cannot produce um, their bat fantasy. Uh, unfortunately, sorry, left-wing men, but that's a lot of what's going on with the anti-woke left. But I think a lot of them don't understand some of the history. They always go back to this working class ideal that existed in the 1920s and 30s. And that doesn't really exist today. And that really goes with the anti-woke left or the fantasy left that I was talking about, is that they imagine that there's still these, you know, hardworking factory workers out there. I mean, yes, there are, of course, factory workers out there. And they're existing in a type of 1920 economy and society and they're working 16 hours a day and they've got suit all over their all over their face and they're coming out and they're hard bitten and they're just smoking their cigar on their of course cigar break it's not a cigarette break this is how old school they are <laughs> and they're just waiting for this podcaster who's got a neck beard and has got problem glasses and they go up to them like i'm with you and they're like Absolutely, because we're totally just want to focus on class and down with the bourgeoisie. And they kind of and they do admire this as their ideal. And somebody did have a pretty decent rebuttal as Sean McCarthy, who's one of the better anti woke leftists. And quality of anti woke leftist depends on not everyone, some of them are terrible, some of them are good. Sean McCarthy is one of the better ones. He had a reasonable response to my takes. He said, quote, FDR's New Deal coalition would today probably be described as national conservative or far more likely fascist, but it very much existed and very much was not about identity politics. Actually, in some ways, that is true. I mean, it was, it had a lot of noble achievements or rather noble aims, not so much noble achievements. I mean, even though Social Security and the Tennessee Valley Authority are great things, but there's also a lot of terrible things associated with the New Deal. <laughs> It had noble aims. It wanted to make life better for most Americans. And it was rallying around just we're creating a better life for ordinary Americans. But there was an identity politics aspect to this. It was heavily appealed to the immigrant communities who saw themselves outside the WASP mainstream. It was a very much a backlash against the WASP dominance of the 1920s, of the of you know, in the 1920s, there was definitely very much a wasp backlash against the immigrant communities. You know, yet the Klan had over a million members, at least. Uh, they passed the 1924 Immigration Act. You had presidents like Calvin Coolidge saying America was founded by Nordic stock and everyone else is a guest. And so the FDR's coalition, even though FDR himself was a wasp, was very much on a backlash against this. It's like, sorry, WASP, this is in your country this more. This is for us immigrants and us white ethnics, as well as these Southern whites who, even though, yes, they had very right-wing reactionary views, they also saw themselves as outside of the WASP Yankee mainstream, which they associated with the Midwest and the East Coast establishment. And they also joined in at the same time that they demanded that their seg that segregation was respected and many and you new deal did respect uh segregation it didn't try to overturn it but it did plant the seeds for its eventual overturning and it was appealing to blacks in a way that past democrats hadn't done that so to say that it wasn't yeah i mean compared to today i mean you know fdr was not putting his gender pronouns out there he wasn't demanding that these check you know coal miners <laughs> check their white privilege yeah <laughs> checks checking white privilege and this is that was not what it was about but it was appealing to them in a type of identity politics that did appeal to them as who they were as in their identity as a immigrant that they were different from the wasp mainstream and this was uniting this whole coalition together to build a new america that later laid the groundwork for the civil rights movement and all these other movements that we've seen in the past 60, 70 years. No, that's definitely right. Although uh, to point out, uh, FDR was not a wasp. He was a, a Dutchman. So that's a, they, he is, I think when people are like, oh, excuse me, he actually <laughs> had a French Huguenot name. Uh, yeah, I mean, all these people came in assimilate. He was from the East Coast. I'm not yelling at you, but there's always people who will say that who are like, Teddy Roosevelt wasn't a wasp. He had a Dutch name. And and it's like they all assimilated. I mean, 
it's yes. like to be pedantic though the the dutch are the uh the merchants of europe so there there's something going that on is there. true and then to say you from that the, the new deal is is kind of i mean i you could see it as maybe an anti-woke thing in a way but it's it definitely is more um more of the neoliberal project that kind of corresponds to how the, the system adopted wokeness later because it is in its interest to preserve uh as much uh, racial integration and homogenization is possible to maximally efficient to make the workforce more efficient and have a bigger work pool of people to uh, have more immigrants coming in for cheap labor of course and uh and it, it's they they adopted to not only do that but also because it becomes popular it's uh signaling points you can get with uh, your marketing team so yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's and all of its culture projects i mean the uh, new deal had was sponsoring these plays and and novels and movies that were out there and all these plays were about integration and feminism and all this left wing because i mean they were hiring communists and socialists to write this stuff and they were all like implementing it wasn't you definitely saw wokeness of the 1930s if you went and saw a play that was produced by a New Deal program. And at the same time, the New Deal helped elevate the Ellis Islanders as the new elite, I mean, through the administrative state. And the administrative state was taken over by several of these people who were um, protégés of Felix Frankfurter. And most of them, many of them were Jewish and other, you know, recent immigrant ethnic backgrounds. And they were at get elevated. And they, of course, in the 50, in the 40s and 50s were fully embraced the civil rights movement and, and they themselves thought were extremely anti-WASP and extremely anti, you know, the old stock America. And they wanted to create a new country that be, be led by them. It was multi, more multicultural, was fully in the melting pot moment. And yeah, I don't think you could really say that FDR himself was building an anti woke left. And then the more important point is you can't build that coalition today. As, as I was saying before, is that working class that all these anti woke leftists and a lot of people were tweeting at me, they're like showing off the Pullman strikers and all this stuff is like that working class doesn't really exist today. You know, yes, there are still people working in factories there and, you know, life is hard for them. And there's a lot of towns that have been, you know, run down by you know, outsourcing and other means. But at the same time, like, you know, some of these working class people are, <laughs> if they play their cards right, you know, they're making more money than the average person who comes from, you know, a lot of these anti-woke leftists who have a very bourgeois background, you know, have an elite degree. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're like a trained laborer, you're making pretty good money as opposed to somebody who has a fine arts degree from a liberal arts university. And, is a podcast a struggling podcaster <laughs> you know that's you know that person's all doing much better and then the way their life and being ordered you know they're not necessarily doing you know mundane factory work and they're also not likely part of a union so a lot of these aspects are not even around and even if you look at the labor unions today i mean labor unions are so dependent on public sector uh workers you know people are working in the government and most of them are uh you know, quite interested in identity politics, because many of them are black women or other minorities who want additional benefits. They fully support affirmative action. They fully support racial quotas. And these labor unions are no longer standing against immigration because they see it as another uh, potential are really a customer base for unions, for joining the unions. So they want them in and they know that the left wing coalition that they have to be a part of has to be pro open borders. So even though it hurts American workers who came here legally are Native Americans themselves. They want to embrace full blow, full blown mass immigration because that's what the left wing coalition demands. So, I mean, union you can't expect unions to turn into anti woke left because they're they fully bought into the woke left. I mean, they're all down for multiculturalism and mass immigration and affirmative action. They don't want to overturn it, even though it hurts American workers. They just don't care anymore. So they're imagining, and also these ethnic immigrant communities don't ex really exist anymore. Ethnic enclaves outside of like South Boston and some areas in the Northeast where there's like strong Italian communities and, you know, a few places in the Midwest, you know, ethnic enclaves don't exist anymore. Those are now like suburban whites. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> I've said this before on my podcast, but there'll be like, 
these conservatives who are just like, I, I, I'm not white. I'm half Irish and quarter Polish and a quarter Italian. <laughs> that means I'm not white. I'm, I'm actually mostly Irish because I, my family bought a Dropkick Murphy's CD and that's my culture. So they'll like cling to that, but it's not really their culture anymore. So that ethnic um, communities don't exist anymore. There's very much the new left has to depend on the new immigrants who are very much benefit from identity politics, blacks uh, who benefit heavily from identity politics, and white liberals who are fully committed to, who don't necessarily benefit from identity politics and are ultimately hurt by identity politics, but they fully believe it and they hate uh, the bad whites more than they like being white themselves. I mean, they're full of self-hatred. So this coalition i don't really see where the anti-woke coalition would come from or what constituency they have yeah it's it's really an optics problem when you think about it because i mean what's left of the white working class and really a more generally college non-college educated whites uh, do not want to be part of something where they are constantly self-flagellating and being told that they should all be killed for their uh, the sins of their fathers and whatnot um and further beyond that it's it's Impressively consider because building that kind of coalition would really be something unprecedented, even in the face, you know, um, because capitalism has done a much better job of integrating and socially progressivizing uh, the people than, say, socialism did. I mean, just look at how uh, reaction, socially reactionary, I guess, the Eastern Europe is versus the United States. And you kind of see that it would be difficult to have a um, have that kind of coalition without the kind of uh, rabid uh, anti-white kind of um, or to at least uh, homogenize everybody in that way without a um, the kind of active wokeness that people are trying to implement. So, yeah, that's true. And I think in Europe, there you could claim that there was a. Uh, left free of identity politics. But as you were saying, like these are 100% ethnically homogenous. I mean, there wasn't mm -hmm. like some non white community that they had to appeal to in, you know, in Germany in the 1920s. I mean, it was all German. So, I mean, they were just, and they were able to focus entirely on class with this class based analysis. And this is only a part of the left. I mean, their left always had these dopey intellectuals and middle class types who loved the other. And they were all about like elevating them as like seen with the radical Republicans and abolitionists and all these other groups that were generally can come from, you know, respectable or what would be claimed as parts of the white middle class. So we've always had a white liberal problem. You know, it wasn't necessarily that the, it was an entirely working class movement that just focused on class. There's always been elements of fighting against other groups in the country and seeing them as the enemy, whether it's the WASP or, you know, the WASP seeing it as the ethnic immigrants who are coming in or, you know, region, north first, south, uh, south, uh, south, <laughs> I don't know what the south <laughs> is, but the south. And it ignored, like, we've never had this entirely class-based politics, even with the New Deal. And even with these groups that they were highlighting, like, Everyone kept talking to me about the Wobblies, but what about the Wobblies? I was like, well, the Wobblies themselves were entirely dependent on ethnic immigrant labor. They were fully embraced the civil rights movement, They and they demanded members accept Blacks as members, even though most of their members didn't want Blacks in membership with them. And this same problem came up with the socialists and the communists. And even for a lot of these strikes, like a part of their reason was motivated by identity politics is that these you know, factory owners were using blacks as strike breakers. And this was such an outrage to these workers that they, you know, they, they're like, they're like, do not hire blacks. You are trying to use them as scab labor against us. And yes, that's a form of identity politics by basing that they are seeing race and ethnicity here, which a lot of these anti-woke lefts want to pretend that they just saw class, which, you know, they didn't see them blacks as fellow working class. They saw them as a distinct other that they didn't want in their community and in their factory. And that's something that's not understood by the anti-woke left. And now I want to say is like, this isn't necessarily like an attack on the anti-woke left, like the whole podcast, even though we're doing a whole thing, like um, <laughs> undermining some of their claims. I'm going to say it's like most of them are good. I think 
some are goofy, especially the more mainstream ones like Saeed Jelani, who will always just say like, what people in the 90s never even saw race. You know, that's like his theme for everything. And it's like, everyone welcome me as a Pakistani immigrant. And there's other people like that who are just like really goofy. But otherwise, like some of them are very beneficial, especially when they go encounter popular left wing narratives. Uh, but we'll get that to that in a moment with, you know, looking at this thing. But I want to say is that with a lot of the anti-woke left, it's not, I was previously alluding to this, it's not a working class movement. The best way to describe it is the lumpen bourgeoisie. Of course, there was the old term lumpen, lumpen proletariat, which referred to almost like criminal elements or elements that were like on the fringes of the working class. And they're like the bad elements. But I mean, not necessarily the lumpen bourgeoisie is as, uh, criminal as the lumpen proletariat, proletariat, but it is an element of the, these guys grew up in middle and upper class households, and they just generally didn't succeed in life. They're fail sons. And Chapo Trap House, which exists in some ways on the anti-woke left, even though they embrace the wokeness much more than Red Scare, they've always referred to their audience as fail sons. And I think this is very accurate. This is like a guy who maybe went to college and spent his whole time getting high and playing video games and didn't, you know, turn out well, he either uh, got a degree after five years or he didn't get a degree at all. And now he's been like, you know, working odd jobs or he's in a dead end office job, which he doesn't really like. And he thinks that he himself is a working class member because he, one summer in high school, he worked at Quiznos and thus he is now a worker. And he maybe many of them still may work at Quiznos. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with Quiznos, but Quiznos is not the coal mine of the 1910s. <laughs> you know, there's a very diff there's a big difference between you and those workers you idolize in LARP as. And they and so I think this is like a big class thing. And I think you've been seeing this element, the Lumpen bourgeoisie, out in the streets. Is I think this is the most fervent avant-garde of these riots that are going on involving Black Lives Matter and Antifa is that these are guys who are working jobs that have been hurt heavily and the coronavirus in the service sector has been devastated by it. Uh, there is a lot of economic anxiety over this, but to go against the anti-woke left's claims that like economics is what primarily motivate them is that they're rioting and burning down their cities over identity issues. And most of these are white people. And so they fully buy into the racial justice nonsense and they're not caring about, they're not like burning down like the Quiznos <laughs> corporate headquarters. <laughs> they're going and burning down, you know, the police headquarters. They're burning, they're demanding that everyone who is black never get arrested before or that any person who gets shot uh, while black, while doing a criminal act, that this is an outrage and a genocide and we must, you know, kill cops over it. So that's yeah. what they're primarily focused on. It is something that they don't, that that is their constituency right there. And if you're seeing what they're you know advocating for, it's not anything that's threatening capital because all these giant corporations endorse them and backing them and don't mind if they you know, smash their windows or even torch their business because they have insurance. They're primarily target. The people who really hurt are small business owners who they view as the evil capitalist, but it's usually just a guy who's barely getting by. And now that his business is torched, you know, maybe even it has insurance. He still can't build back that business the way it was because the whole neighborhood has been devastated. So I think this, you know, that constituency just doesn't exist anymore. And do you think that's correct that these people are not working class, that it is, a you know more affluent middle class background that a lot of these anti woke leftists come from. Uh, definitely, I mean, I think that's one of the pitfalls of their their movement, and it's um it it really is. You compared it to kind of like being a based black. I think I see it more as like being an anti SJW conservative or libertarian, more like taking the high road with regards to these racial issues, like the appealing to um, to universality and all those and, uh, you know, universal class instead of like universal, like uh, liberal values as Sargon might. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no, that is, that is definitely true. I mean, it's um, it it just is alienating in that sense from the average person who kind of sees it. And, and well, I mean, and also just um, 
even like in a sense, the woke left is more correct because at least they're trying to address what is actually there, like with regards to race and, and gender. And, you know, it, the way I see it is like when you really look at the, the data and uh, the statistics, it's you kind of have to either come to the conclusion that there's some kind of persistent uh, underlying environmental force, like in the, the specter of uh, implicit racism or white privilege or you have to accept the fact that there could be inherent differences between groups and that's and we can't option. do that no, that's no. not that's that is that is identitarianism as as the intellectual dark web keeps warning of you about so i cannot yes. fall into that trap that's that that makes you just like them scott when you yeah, when you, <laughs> yeah the all right and the sjw's are the same side of the are on the same side we got the we got the horseshoe theory is correct <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's it's uh, essentially more or less how I see it. Yeah, no, and that's true. And, and also, and add another point to, you know, how identity politics really does motivate the far left or the DSA types and everything is that Bernie Sanders fully embraced identity politics in 2020, and all these people like Michael Tracy were like, "Oh, this is why he lost. Like he he was too busy, you know, f focusing on trans rights and Black Lives Matter." And this is what made him lose. And I was like, well, those old whites, a lot of those old whites that voted for him in 2016 are just now like Republicans. They're voting for Trump. Like the, there's nothing to have made them leave the uh, Republican plantation, as you would say. And those people are just not with him anymore. And if he hadn't have done that, he would have lost his main core activist base. The activist base that was all around him wanted this. And if you look at his, you know, mm -hmm. the successors of his movement, you know, AOC, Ilan Omar are even more dedicated to, to identity politics. I don't even think they talk about economic justice. If you look at all their plans, like the Green New Deal, you know, it's a racial wealth redistribution scheme. It's nothing about helping the working class. And AOC herself, I talked about this in the last podcast, is insistent on being called by her title and wants higher pay as a congresswoman. It's very much awful concerns that motivate her. I think that's a very much the same way with a lot of people on the left is that they want to have a bigger piece of the pie, not necessarily work. Uh, I think a laziness and drug use is a <laughs> are two are two very <laughs> common traits of the two of left. Not necessarily saying some of those are necessarily bad. Well, actually, yeah, they are bad things, but um yeah, they just want to have, they want UBI so they can sit at home, smoke weed, and play video games all day. Now, some of my listeners may think that's the dream life, but you should not <laughs> fall into that. You, that is not the dream life. That is like the, um, oh, the movie, uh, oh, crap, I can't believe it. It's like the, uh, the the Pixar movie with the robot that's like in, that's on the planet, and then it like goes back. Um spaceship this is like so stupid anyway that like in the movie all the fat all the humans are stuck on a ship and they're just fat and they're just eating like fast food all day and that's all they do oh wally yeah wally very this is not culture knowledge this is what happens when you become a millennial you forget you forget old movies you forget popular Pixar movies that everyone should say next they'll be like what's that movie from like the 90s where it's like a big <laughs> ship and it crashes into an iceberg and like Leonardo DiCaprio is in it. I can't remember what it's called. You know, if that, when that happens, please alert authorities. You know, I'm already undergoing Alzheimer's and um, so hopefully we find a cure, but this is one of the problems with getting old. Anyway. Yeah. That's, that's like the lifestyle they want. It's like the, um, the, they had a, like the luxury, full luxury communism uh, that they've always advocated for is that you get that life. You get to just like sit at home and like live in total comfort and eat hamburgers and smoke weed and just play video games all day. And that is their like dream, which I think to the right is like a nightmare. That's like not living. And then even in that movie, Wally, -E, like the fat people on board decide that they want, uh, you know, to experience life that they realize that the life that is portrayed through them on the screens is not what they want. And they revolt against the machine. They revolt against the system. Thanks to Wally's help. <laughs> and, but to the left, they just want to sit in their chairs. They want that life because they don't want to work. They don't have any great aspirations. They just want society to provide for them, uh, which I find is very unappealing to the right. But going on to the, like this, when I was saying that, 
you know, anti woke leftists are the right wing Twitter as base blacks. It's not necessarily saying they're the similar that they're the same. Is that anti woke lefts are just have a grift and they know that there's an audience that will pay them for these takes, which most of them don't make that much money off right wing Twitter, and it actually causes a lot of problems for them to be popular among right wing Twitter among their core audience. Uh, so I wouldn't say that is the same way. It's just the same way with I had a follow up tweet where it's like a right, you know, it's a soy boy Wojak who's going like, ah, it's a, it's a leftist who doesn't believe all white people should be exterminated. Oh, wow. Wow. The, the real left is leaving the id pole plantation. You know, and this is what any time this happens is that the whole, everyone on the right wants, or the real right, not necessarily conservative Inc., wants like this alliance with this fantasy left. And it doesn't matter. You know, integralists want it. Wig Nats want it. Um, some of the people who are Trump supporters want it. And it's like, first off, the left loses um, a lot by, by allying with these elements of the right, even if it's total cucked elements, like the post-liberal conservatives, which we'll go into them in a moment. But if they're like associating with people that like ordinary liberals are going to call racist, like that presents problems for them. You know, it's a huge risk for red scare to have steve bannon on even though steve bannon is way more important has a far bigger audience than red scare it was a more of a benefit to bannon than it was to red scare it actually harmed red scare's brand among them because all of their fans are like you're elevating a fascist and a nazi and a white supremacist meanwhile like steve bannon gets to be seen as this real intellectual who appeals to honest leftists and that he can sit down and have an honest conversation about them about how they can all get together and just focus on economic issues so that is a huge benefit to them but you know i don't really see any alliance happening with the left and everyone on the right is always about this uh you know alliance with the fantasy left and they they just like the anti-woke left imagine that there's these 1920 factory workers are on their break or just really tired of having to use pronouns at their uh, 1920s factory that's making them work 12 hours a day and you know polluting, giving them several carcinogens on the job and they're just ready for P, uh, you know economic nationalists or integralists or whoever or wignats to show up and they'll convince them to ally and then this great grand alliance will topple the system which the left is never going to do that, as by the points I've stated before, is that it's primarily I motivated by identity issues. They're by allying with us, they no longer become the left. They're just the right. And I think that the better ones of the anti-woke left are just the ones who are not still leftists. They just call themselves leftists, but they're going more and more to the right. I think when you look at a lot of Anna Kachan's better tweets, you know, it's just straight stuff from Bronze Age Pervert or other right wingers she's reading. You know, that's nothing leftist about what she's saying. Uh, some others like to couch it in some Marxian gobbledygook, but with them, it's just they become to the right. And yeah. it's not like we shouldn't appeal to them. I think we should appeal to them or like have like relation or like have positive relations with them on Twitter or like go on their podcast. Like that's not like you need to declare unrelenting war on anti-woke leftists. Some some more than others, like Zai Jelani, who I think I've already brought up before, if he's interacting with you and you're on the right, you suck. Like that's like that is like a good barometer if if he's interacting with you because he sees you as safe and kosher as somebody who doesn't interact with identity issues and doesn't really go to the heart of the matter. You just like focus on foreign policy or economic nationalism. And if he's out there like being your mentor, like that's a that's a problem. But if you know Sean McCarthy or Red Scare or uh, Amy Therese, yeah, that's I mean it's probably a sign that you're actually a smart person on the right. Yeah, I've seen some interesting takes from some of them that they'll almost have like a conservative bent. They they do seem squeamish on the race stuff, but it's like I think I've seen Amy Therese be surprisingly pro police, um, and she also seems to like be more oriented towards traditional families and and stuff. And uh, I've seen Zizek say like, uh, yeah, the, the immigration stuff is all the mass immigration is bad and all that, and it is. You do see a lot of that kind of seep through. There is kind of like a conservative instinct to a lot of them. 
Yeah, and Zizek, we've unfortunately not talked about Zizek, but he's like the ultimate anti-woke leftist. I like it, Zizek for the content. I mean, he's uh, he definitely uh, his videos are very funny. Uh, I appreciate that he exists and he's, he's, he's sniffing. He's like Zizek, you do the ultimate. You know, he's like you probably do a little bit better impression than me. But I mean, I remember when he wrote the article that like the alt right and the left should like join forces, and people were having like. Uh, were, it's like a wet dream for some people. People are jerking off into it. They're like, this is the greatest thing ever. The alliance is finally happening. But it's like Zizek. I mean, Zizek has like, yeah. he loves being a contrarian and a gadfly who, you know, flies in the face of political correctness. And he gets gets to say whatever he wants. I mean, he's a Slovenian uh, guy wearing sweatpants and a T-shirt to like a serious academic conference and like con constantly sniffing. Like he can do whatever he wants. And he likes the fact that he's like, you know, poking his eye and in, in, in the in the status quo and against the people who say you can't say that Zizek, and he just doesn't anyway. So I respect him for that matter, but it's not like Zizek is the more the most important force on the left. Like I would say, Ibram X Kendi is more important yeah. or more representative of the left than Zizek. I mean, people who are into Zizek in America are probably split 50-50 right and left. I would even say it's probably, if you like Zizek, it's more of a sign that you're on the right than the left now. I mean, 10 years ago, of course, that would have been different. Or 10 or 15, five years ago, that would have been very different. But now I'd almost say it's more likely you're going to be on the right than on the left. Yeah, and he's def definitely the biggest anti-woke voice in academia, but he's also very um, insulated from the rest of it. He's not He's somewhat heterodox compared to you know the rest of what the rest of academia is saying, of course, um, given what colleges are doing now. And he, he's not very much a maverick in that regard. Yeah, and I want to go on to one group on the right that is almost exactly the same as the anti-woke left. And for lack of a better term, you would call them the post-liberal conservatives. I would, I mean, I would argue they're the exact same as the anti-woke leftists, except they're dorks who lack all edge, and they're not really funny or running podcasts. Anti-woke leftists are mostly stoners who count as cool in politics. I mean, not that I say that's a high compliment, but people think <laughs> Chapo is cool. People think Red Scare is cool. People don't necessarily think American Affairs is cool or Sagar and Jetty is cool. I mean, even though uh, some of them get touted by, Seth, or I almost said Seth Rogen, Joe Rogan. <laughs> Very different. But another difference is that the post-liberals are actually gaining influence of the right, unlike the anti-poll types of the left. I think that they're losing influence in many cases. I mean, some of them are still gaining influence and are gaining followers through their podcasts, but on the general left, as evidenced by you know the BLM riots this summer, it sounds like they're losing um, influence. But like the anti-woke left, the post-liberals deny politics, but from a different direction. Post-liberal conservatives mostly care about pretending whites don't exist and white identity politics must be vanquished. On the left, it's more about minority identity politics. With the post-liberals, it's about gatekeeping against white identity politics. They also want a class-based politics instead of a race-based politics. Do you see the post-liberals growing in stature or is this just a fad? I haven't even really heard of them. Are they like the integralists or integralists? It's like the integralists. It's like uh, I mean, Sagar and Jetty, uh, American Fairs, Julius Krein, uh, some of what American conservative is doing. It, you see this a lot. And it's like the kosher people who are all about Trumpism, but they get very offended if you ever bring race into this, or if you ever mention that white people might exist, and they're very much about gatekeeping. It is kind of an elite phenomenon. I guess by the fact that you're not necessarily aware of what the post-liberals are is an indication that maybe it's not a big thing. <laughs> I, they're getting a lot of puff pieces and profiles from liberal press about like, this is a new conservatism that's like pro-worker. And I would say Josh Hawley, um, you know, is like the embodiment of it in terms on a political sphere. Yeah, so I, I would say I'm... it's Trumpism stripped of the identity issues and the racial appeals is the best way to describe it. Yeah, it's I, I haven't heard of it, but I kind of know the milieu you're talking about. So I think I can comment on it a little bit. It, it'll really be a struggle to keep that going forward if they even want to try in the Republican Party, uh, because it's it's kind of like almost this kind of contradiction. It kind of lacks the 
the working class and the uneducated uh, worker, white, white voter appeal that Trump had, but it's also very much against what the elites want. So it's, it's not really, it doesn't really have a substantial base, I don't think, to work with. I mean, I think they can siphon off a bit of the Trump support, but it, I don't think it's going to be a substantial force. I think um, uh, the continuation of Trumpism is a more viable option for the populist, right? Yeah, and they lack the populist element there, that they're not, and they always don't like Trump's tweets. Like, there was all these puff pieces when the National Conservatism Conference happened last summer, uh, summer 2019, and they're all like, they were all, I, Trump had these like great tweets about how Ilhan Omar should be deported <laughs> at that <laughs> time. And then they were all asking, journalists were asking about them, th these tweets, and they're like, uh, yeah, I don't know anything about these tweets. I don't want to talk about it. We just want to talk about industrial policy and and national sovereignty and all these, and it's all these like intellectual concepts. And imagine that the working class wants Julius Krein, who's uh, I think comes from has a high, Ivy League background. I think he went to a prep school. He lo wears glasses. Looks like a total dork. And th that guy is going to win over the working class to just focusing on industrial policy and then like correcting them if they ever say anything bad about Hispanics or blacks. And it's clearly not even. And they're always like, we want a multiracial, multicultural, uh, working class movement. And you already see Trump doing this with like all the Latin Hispanic support he's having just by being a the anti-BLM candidate and saying we don't want more immigration. And a lot of these Hispanics, they're like, yeah, I hate illegal immigrants. I hate how these riots are taking over our cities and I want law and order and I really don't like, <laughs> they're the, the, the Hispanics who are voting for Trump are the real anti-woke left. That's my hot take. <laughs> they're, they're actually just want their class-based politics that just want law and order and to not be undermined by scab illegal immigrant labor or more legal immigrant labor in, in many such cases. So they lack a lot of the populist bluster that made Trump you know, a popular candidate. And he has like, and Trump has celebrity star power due to his like, due to his politically incorrect statements he said all the time. And those statements he said made him, you know, president. Uh, I've said this in my AFPAC speech uh, earlier this year is that, you know, when he went down the escalator, he wasn't talking about industrial policy. He was talking about how Hispanics are bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, some I assume are good people. You know, that was his message <laughs> that defined his campaign throughout. And all, additionally, with law and order and everything like that, it was not any of these issues that the post liberals care about. But one of the things that is important for the post liberals is they desperately desire validation from the anti-woke left they the american fairs always reaches out to leftist right for them so they can gain respectability they're very much worried about being called racist whenever they're called racist they don't have a trump response by saying something ridiculous like i'm the least racist person i know uh, or just like saying racism what is that you know they don't have that cool response to it they 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 melt down. They're like, I have black friends. There's so many blacks where we just want a multicultural, multiracial working class movement that's uh, ending euthanasia and, uh, you know, has industrial policy. That's all we want. And they really do want the validation that comes from going on a red scare or having a leftist say that I really like, you know, their video series or their book. And one of the best examples of this is uh, Sagar and Jetty, who is now the co-host of The Hills Rising, which is a pretty popular program. Joe Rogan always highlights it. And, you know, I used to work with him at The Daily Caller. And he actually didn't vote for Trump. I believe he either voted for Hillary Clinton or, or Evan McMullen, but now he's like uh, considered a Trumpist figure. And I believe this is at 2019 CPAC and Chapo Trap House was there and they're doing their thing. And he awkwardly approached them and he's like, hey, I'm, this is before he was hosting the, the Hill, so they wouldn't have necessarily known who he was. And he's like, introduced himself. He's like, hey, I'm a big fan of your show. I love it. And they were just like, okay. And they like shrugged him off. They didn't care because for a lot of them, they don't gain anything by giving them validation. I mean, there's the few people on the Red Scare who like have a genuine admiration for these people and they're genuinely interested in their ideas, but they actually do lose some of their credibility by you know, giving them the validation they want or by citing them. And for a lot of these post-liberals, this is a cynical move 
that's not necessarily motivated motivated by genuine you know the genuine principles are genuinely what they believe they see this as a way to further keep themselves relevant and have influence in a Trumpian moment. As I was saying, is not just Sagar, is that several other people were also Evan McMullen voters, are neoconservatives, and are, are even really terrible open borders liberals, or libertarians rather. And now they're saying like, oh, I'm a Trumpian nationalist. I know what nationalism is, and I'm going to define it for you guys. And they're doing this in order to advance their career. With the anti-woke left, they're actually genuinely don't like the identity politics. They are taking a risk by saying, you know, by interacting with right wingers and conservatives. Some of them gain by it, but most, you know, as Saul with the backlash by Red Scare having Bannon on, they do take some risks. They're genuinely interested in this. This is a, you know, they, they are intellectually curious and they are stating what they believe. While I think with a lot of the post liberals, you know, this is just, they're trying to exploit the Trumpian moment for their own gain. Uh, Yoram Hazoni is also a really bad offender, is that <laughs> during the Tea Party era, he was trying to position himself as the Tea Party intellectual guru. And he was talking about the the Hebrew roots of, of the Tea Party. And now he talks about the Hebrew roots of nationalism. Um, so yeah, I don't. I think you shouldn't necessarily trust. I I don't think I, I'd have to agree. It's like I don't think there's much of a future for this. I think as America First is inevitable, and and an America First movement stripped of the identity issues is not an America First movement. It's just an intellectual exercise, and it's just a a movement to help certain right wing uh, conservative uh, intellectuals and writers to have a career and think that they're edgy and show difference from conservative ink and appeal to liberals and say, look, look, I'm smart. I understand that we uh, need a different healthcare policy and I'm not a libertarian. And it's not actually a movement that appeals to ordinary people. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, it's the same kind of mentality as the Lincoln Project. Like if you constantly need validation from the, from the opposite side, you're not going to end up in any good position whatsoever. And the Lincoln Project's making a lot of money. But the Lincoln Project's, uh, you know, there's a, there are some similarities, but it really is them a very expensive marketing pitch. Well, they're making a ton of money off it to Democratic candidates that they should use their services because they know that Republican candidates will never use them again. Um, so, I mean, I guess I don't respect the grift, but I understand the grift and why they're doing it. Um, but with a lot of these guys, it's like intellectuals. Like if Trump loses, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. And I always said this is that they're so desiring of avoiding the racist label that I predicted if national conservatism was going to have a second conference, that they would have endorsed a type of reparation, which coronavirus prevented a second a national conservatism conference in America. I assume that the next time they have it, and depending on you know where we're at in the country, that there will be a speaker, they'll like debate reparations, and then they'll like have their like corny cornball reparations that it's also tied to uh, like pro natalist policy is like uh we're gonna help reparations by helping like uh ending abortion and helping and giving huge subsidies to blacks for having kids and it's like well you know we already have that through welfare but um, they would probably suggest that anyway so it'll be something like that um but, you know, in conclusion, like some of these anti-woke leftists, I like, I follow them, I retweet them, and some of them have interesting insights. But I think thinking that these people are going to be our allies and we're going to have a serious coalition with them and that there's this fantasy of left emerging that's going to dispense with identity politics and be okay with race realism and identity, and identity issues from a right-wing perspective, that's just not going to happen. And they know what the costs are for seeing what associating with our ideas and they still want their little niche audience and if they went full board right that uh, they wouldn't be the left anymore they would just be right wingers so we we want them to come to our side um if you know they're seeing what's happening with the democratic party and the left and realizing that there's no place for normal straight white people who you know have questions about the prevailing economic order and the political order that you know the current Democratic Party is an once awful, uh, the awful technocratic state, 
AWFL, not awful as like it's, but it is <laughs> awful as well. Um, you know, if they have problems with that, the only home for them is the right. Like there is no more home for them on the left. So I think that's really what we have to address to the left and saying like, look, there's no place for you, white man. Come home, come home to the to America first. This is your home. We'll be there with open arms. So that's that's the final point I would say about that. If Amber and Peter, you got any other last minute thoughts on the anti woke left? Uh, not particularly. Um, you said you like a few of them. Who would you say is your your favorite to go to? I guess. Well, I would say Sean Sean McCarthy. I like. Uh, I think most of them are just good for content. Like they're very good content providers. Like I think both Dasha and Annika Chan and Amy Therese are just good content providers. I don't necessarily, some Amy Therese takes I like, um, some I'm just like baffled by and like, what? <laughs> I don't, uh, some I'm just like, what does this mean? And then, uh, but I appreciate the content they provide. Um, I do like uh, McCarthy's takes. There's some people who, uh, I think there are right wingers who are pretending to be anti woke left, who are out there. But you know, and some people on the right are trying to move to the anti woke left. We won't mention who they are uh, because they're very desiring of attention, especially <laughs> for me. But I will not mention them on my podcast. Um, but <laughs> and I think in part they're moving to the left because they realize a lot of these people don't have a serious intellectual grounding, is that they're trying to move through Marx and stuff, and they realize that they can provide a worldview and an intellectual basis that is more appealing to them and more appealing to the moment but it avoids actual like addressing the real issues so that they can blame the cia and the rockefeller foundation as the as the roots of all evil in the world and not saying that the cia and rockefeller foundation aren't bad but i think it's uh it's a little bit of a stretch to say that they're like the root of everything, but a lot of these people really love conspiracy theories, and it's a lot of people on the right love conspiracy theories too. I, I'm not actually, I'm actually not a fan of conspiracy. Anytime, like even if it's like a real one that I'll believe, but if it's like delivered to me as like this person knew this person and this person was a part of this organization, this, this, then that. It's like playing six degrees of Kevin Bacon as a political theory, and I really don't, you know, some of it, you know, it's interesting to note, but. I'm not really into that, but the anti-woke left are very much into it, and especially a lot of the right-wingers who are moving in their direction are into that. But that's all we have to say on that topic. Now moving on, as some of my devoted listeners noted, is that our last podcast with Steve Franz, it had to be re-recorded, and we had a lot of great topics that were cut off because of time constraints. So we're going to bring that back now with our very respected guest, American Renaissance, Peter Griffin. So one of the points I wanted to make in the last uh, podcast, but I didn't necessarily get to do, is that of how hard journalists are in the tank for Biden and all of his ridiculousness and all his controversies that are emerging. And in the last debate when he said, when Joe Biden said that he wants to eliminate the oil industry, journalists went into full mode and saying, I don't think people are going to care. You know, people don't really care about the oil industry. And one of the people who had a viral tweet on this matter was supposed conservative journalist, Tim Alberta. Tim, uh, interesting story. Both me and Tim won the same conservative journalism fellowship in the same year in 2018. Of course, uh, uh, mine had to be taken away for reasons, <laughs> but I still won it and he was able to keep it. And with that funding, he was able to write this horrible book called American Carnage that was all anti-Trump and anti-GOP and all about how conservatives are racist and Republicans embrace racism and they're going to pay for it in the end. And this was funded by a conservative foundation. And one of the people who gave him that fellowship, uh, Molly Hemingway, now regrets it. And she's told him that. It's like, we funded you to become a conservative journalist. Now you're just a shit lib. And many such cases of this happening with conservative journalists. I've talked about this in some uh, prior podcasts and tweets. But regardless of that, Tim Alberta was saying that most Americans aren't going to care about this because they're already transitioning away from from oil from oil and fossil fuels. And they're just, they just understand it's going to happen, that they're going to have to rely on solar panels and wind energy. Um, fun fact, 80% of America's energy, energy needs are still met by fossil fuels. So you saying that we're going to have to eliminate the energy, that 80% of our energy is just something that average Joe in Pennsylvania is just going to understand. It's like, huh, I guess my house will now be heated by solar power or, or 
whatever. I'm just going to have to dispense with all this uh, fossil fuels for the good of the environment. And thank you, DC journalists, for understanding how I'm totally okay with having to refurbish my house and potentially my whole community losing their jobs because they depend on the energy industry. But it's going to be all be okay because we're transitioning to this. But this is the type of lines that they use. That it's not really. It sounds right, especially if you're somebody living in New York or DC, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I notice I'm using a lot of green energy. But you don't understand how average folks out in middle America are living. And this idea sounds terrible. I mean, this. This is going to bring dramatic changes to their life. It's going to cost more. Living costs are just a, you know, skyrocket. And if you're already seeing, looking at states like California that are trying to implement it, it's like a, a humongous failure. So, yeah, this is like a big deal. But journalists will just chill and say, oh, well, you know, they're transitioning. This isn't a big deal. And along with not saying things that are not a big deal, of course, is Hunter Biden's laptop which a lot of journalists are saying that Hunter Biden's travails are something that a working class white dad would understand in his own son. Because as we all know, most working class white dads have their son come home and say like, dad, I'm, I'm addicted to crack and I'm, I'm interested in my niece. But uh, by the way, can you help me make a million dollars through a Chinese corporation? And you know, the working class white dad is just like, sure, son, because I always help out my idiotic fail son who's dr addicted to drugs. And yeah, this is not the same scenario. I mean, influence peddling is not happening in towns ravaged by the opioid epidemic. Yeah, they do have sons and family members who are struggling with drug addiction. At the same time, they're also not relying on their sons to, you know, funnel money to them and elaborate, you know, corporate schemes and corruption, that this is really what it's about. But journalists will just say this, and it's a pulling a wool over the American's eyes, and it's saying that you don't need to understand these controversies. The real controversies are with Trump. And Biden is a good American who would never lie to us, even though every anecdote he has ever said is a lie. I mean, particularly with the anecdote he had about his dad, him and his dad in 1950s Delaware, going up and seeing a gay couple kiss and his dad being like, listen, son, uh, this is just what love is. And I don't think any, you know, ordinary, supposedly working class dad would have said that to his son in 1950s or even in the 1990s, maybe in the 2000s. But um, this is just what we have to learn from the media. So what do you think is like, how much further in the tank can the media get for Joe Biden? I mean, it is, you, you, even from 2016, you see this marked difference. I, I remember back way back when I was in high school, I had a politics professor who was telling me something like, um, oh yeah, so you want to follow all these news sources he was telling us you know, keep in touch with the news because that's what, you know, educated people did back then. Um, but uh, <laughs> it, it's like, he was like, oh, yeah, so you want to look at, like, um, if you're left-leaning, you look at, like, MSNBC, you're right, you want maybe Fox News. But if you're in the center, you know, maybe it's a little bit towards the left, you look at CNN or something. And CNN now is just so degraded so much. Like, it did seem to have a little bit of pretense of objectivity, even though it did tilt the left. But it is, you look on there and it's like Don Lemon or Anderson Cooper or something like telling you like how race, what the racist thing Trump did today, or it, it's just so brazen now. It's yeah, ridiculous. and the worst is like when they have the panels and it's like former never Trump conservatives who are fully leftists now, like Amanda Carpenter, and they'll have this whole panel and they'll have like one Trump supporter. And then it's like a gang rape uh, like uh, on there on TV where they're just like all <laughs> ganging up this person. They're like, so- does Trump want to murder all black people? And then the person's like, no. And then they're like, oh, honey, let me tell you, he does. And then Don Lemon is like, mm -hmm, that's right. And then the whole panel and Amanda Carpenter's like, real conservatives know that blacks need reparations and racism needs to be exterminated and all races need to be concentration camps. And then the Trump supporter's like, I don't, I disagree. And they're like, Don Lemon's like, I'm shutting you off. I'm not allowing this. And it's just like a, you know, a show trial for like wine moms to really enjoy. Like they're so upset about Trump's news and they get to see this hapless Trump supporter humiliated and dunked on by like eight people on a CNN panel and they just love it.
You know, you yeah, don't ever see this type of humiliation ritual on Fox. I mean, you used to have like Tucker going toe to toe with one liberal, but that was like fair. It was like one on one. It wasn't mm -hmm. like six on one and where they would cut his mic if he said something they disagree with. And they'll always do this. So, yeah. And news sources are totally sucked. Like, I even remember that. They always said CNN was like the centrist source. I would actually rely more on MSNBC. Well, but before Joy Ann Reed became a primetime host, I would say it was probably more centrist. But I mean, Joy Ann Reed now spreads every conspiracy theory imaginable. So I guess MSNBC is now uh, out libtarding CNN at the moment. But well, they used to have Keith Olbermann too, right? And that was pretty uh, out there too. So yeah, for the time in Bush era. But now that yeah. would seem like some of his points are probably conservative. <laughs> <laughs> or it wouldn't be allowed on any, it wouldn't even be allowed on Fox News. I mean, just by the rapid changes you're having. So yeah, I mean, the whole news media, I mean, even compared to 2016, they're fully in the, t way more in the tank for Biden. They'll pretend that any suggestion that he's suffering mental decline, they'll say is outrageous and Russian disinformation, while they'll also contemplate what mental illnesses Trump has. Any any negative story about Biden, immediately they rush to Russian dis disinformation, which they didn't necessarily do in 2016. And they still ran critical news articles about Hillary Clinton. They do not run any critical news about Biden. All of his mm -hmm. poll, he's 15 points ahead in the polls. He's going to win this. He's the greatest American ever. There are so many Americans who are just hyped up to vote for Biden. His rallies have so much energy and enthusiasm when it's like the 10 cars honking at him. Uh, you know, they, they'll pretend that his rallies are great, that he's doing a great job at his, you know, campaigning, that his lids at nine o'clock in the morning where he's just napping the rest of the day because he can't like function as like a, as a normal adult anymore because of his age. No, they'll pretend that doesn't exist. So they were willing to criticize Hillary Clinton. They were willing to print negative news and to show that like there were problems with the campaign. They don't do this this time. And that's why we're seeing that any gaffes or mistakes made by Biden, they'll just rationalize and say, oh, well, it's nothing. So if Hunter Biden, you know, on that Hunter Biden laptop, they found like concrete evidence of Joe Biden, like saying like, make this deal with the Chinese and give me like a 30% cut. They'll be like, this is just a normal business deal. What's wrong with that? We want to we want our politicians to have good relations with China. And we don't want this world war with China. So they'll rationalize anything or they'll just say it's Russian dis disinformation. Uh, there was some Washington Post article saying that we should treat this as disinformation, even though there is no evidence for it, even though it appears it's not. We just need to as like uh, for democracy's sake, which it's not for democracy's sake. They'll just always use that argument for to implement liberal authoritarian technocracy or tech technoc anyway liberal authoritarianism we'll just say that <laughs> for that matter but you know going over to conservative media and their supposed answer for aoc the republican supposed answer that is north carolina congressional candidate madison cawthorn wrote an article last week about how we need a new republican party that reaches out to a diverse america while mostly couched in platitudes and generalities the article appears as an endorsement for a cringe gop that could capitulates on identity issues at the little exact time this op-ed appeared it was reported cawthorn runs a website that attacks journalists for being anti-white and he was so rattled by the negative response to his op-ed that he filmed a you know, haphazard Instagram video where he's going on about, oh, we, I hate open borders. We need border security, but we also need legal immigration. And uh, yeah, please stop attacking me. So what's going on with Madison right now? Do you think, you know, like so many people were excited when he won his primary this summer and everyone's going on about like, oh, this is the future of the GOP. He's going to, he's such a Chad. We love him. And now uh, everyone hates him. Yeah. It he really seems like um, almost like a stereotypical politician in a way, a guy who looks good has the big smile. And in his case, he does look pretty Chad. I think he's seems like he works out in that wheelchair, but uh, he really just is, doesn't seem to be that different except in his, you know, some of his deliver the way he delivers uh, his and projects his uh, ideas. Um, it's the way he kind of was talking about the new Republican party is just a rebranding of the old one with a younger, a more attractive face on it, it seems. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's yeah. the case too. 
I think when you see what a lot of is happening with him, I think he doesn't really know how to campaign or what a message he wants because he everyone in Washington, D.C. and Republican circles is trying to mentor him. And they're like, we want you to be just like us. And I guess the Nikki Haley, Dan Crenshaw, uh, TPUSA people have gotten their hold on him. And now they're just he's repeating what he thinks is what they want. And the national populace and the genuine Trumpists are like, this is stupid. What are you doing? And I don't know, maybe when he gets to Washington, D.C., maybe he'll learn a lesson and like realize that he should stick to one agenda rather than just like flagging around and pretending that there's like going to be a new Gen Z Republican Party that's tolerant and accepting of everyone. And we're the at the forefront of racial justice. And, you know, that, there's no possibility of that. That's going to alienate middle America and it's going to dispossess middle America. So you shouldn't support that. Um, so hopefully, I think he's going to win his seat. It's a safe red district. Uh, he's running against a crazy uh, retired colonel who keeps calling him a Nazi uh, for visiting Berchtesgaden and and like calling his company SPQR. So um, maybe I think he'll win and hopefully learns his lesson from this. But uh, it's another example that you shouldn't get too hyped up on ordinary politicians is that a lot of them will disappoint you in the end. Only get hyped up on Trump because Trump is not a normal politician. So moving on to our final topic. And today, since you know we had a podcast just a few days ago, we're not having any reader questions. We'll have them for next week's episode, or really it'll be the same week, but later in the week. Uh, you know, there's was a great viral tweet uh, that I retweeted about the serious consequences that are having on children with all the social distancing and the masks and the Zoom classes. A parent reported their child got so fed up with her Zoom class that she stormed to her room and drew a very sad picture of said Zoom class. And this tweet got you know several thousand retweets, several thousand likes. And there were several parents in the replies talking about how much their kids hate masks. And they'll like get in their van from school and they're like, how was school today? And the kid will start crying. They're like, I wanna take off the mask. I'm tired of this. And there's all these other people who are talking about how their kids are not learning anything from the Zoom class. And they're just dozing off and they absolutely hate it. And they feel like their childhood's being stripped away from them. At the same time, libtards cannot get enough of social distancing, especially with masks. They love masks. I mean, they think it's like the greatest thing ever. You almost think that they're wearing masks while they're taking a poop in their bathroom. I would, I would not, I would not dispute that they're not doing this. I think they are because they just love these masks. So, what do you think of the long-term effects of zealous social distancing on kids? And do you think that liberals will ever get over their mask fetish and their social distancing fetish? Well, just to preface, I did, I did have to use a porta potty the other day, and the mask did seem to help. So can't really blame them on that front. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, maybe certain scenarios, and that's also a public. That's technically a public restroom, but it's like talking about like their own home bathroom. Yeah, they like put on their like the <laughs> pussy grabs back mask, and they go in their bathroom, and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm showing Trump like what's happening right now. And they love their masks. And like even like the media, like they really try to sigh up into us into like loving masks. Like there's this ad that keeps popping up on Twitter and it's like this family's there. And like the mom, it's like an Asian family and the mom is like putting the mask on her kid and the kid's smiling. And it looks like the mom is just like gagging the kid to like shut up. And they're those like, and everyone's just like happy. And the mom's like smiling, like, oh, love the mask. This is so great. And we're, we're, putting on a mask to walk outside in our own backyard because we need that mask. Like you must be masked at all time. Uh, there was also a New Yorker magazine cover last week where it had a brown, it was like a brown family. It was a dad and, and his child. And they both masked up as they're riding. And it's a cartoon and they're riding on a bicycle. And it's like a little baby who's masked up in the stroller behind are the, the carrier behind the bike. And they're just like sitting there very intently and seriously, like they're, they're loving their masks. And this is what normal people do. And they're keep trying to say that they're like, it's like seatbelts. Like, you're, are you opposed to seatbelts? Well, it's like, you know, a seatbelt doesn't cover your face. So, you know, we are developed to find it weird to have, you know, mask coverings on at all times. And it's also changing our social outlook. Cause like when we're out in public, we're recognizing people by their face. 
And now mm -hmm. you can't see people by their face and it's like some weird surgical mask covering it. So there are these weird elements that is changing society and fundamental human nature that we don't want this stuff on our faces, but they're trying to just say it's like the, it's like a seatbelt, but you know, you don't have to wear a seatbelt, <laughs> you know, outside of your car or as you're walking around uh, when there's no danger, it's just like a way of signaling. And Dr. and Fauci uh, last week endorsed the national mask mandate. If people aren't wearing masks, um, baked Alaska who uh, are, are, are <laughs> at the forefront of documenting uh, contemporary America. Uh, hopefully his videos are included in um, you know future history books. You know, was recording uh, <laughs> over the weekend, like police were arresting people in Nashville, you know, conservative red state, and they're arresting people who are walking around outside without masks. That's what police were doing. And, you know, liberals just love this because they're trusting the lab coats, they're trusting the experts, and it gives them the power over people, over disobedient children. They think of like the people who don't want to wear masks as like the kid who's just like, I don't want to play with, I don't want to sit in my seat. I'm just going to go crazy. And they think that they need to use brute force to make that kid sit in their seat and behave just like all the other obedient children. And they have this mindset where they're, you know, the liberals who are wearing their masks in the car seat are the really good teacher who's following all the rules and setting the example for the rest of the society. And those who are walking around without masks are the dis disobedient students who need to be sent to de detention and suspension for their flagrant violation of what the experts are saying. Um, and with that, I think it's also they like the the humiliating aspect of wearing a mask. It's like all these journalists love having mask obbies as on Twitter, and they all look stupid. And they're all like in their house or car as they're wearing a mask. I'm like, take that off. Like you look like an idiot. It's like they're they're like wearing it, their glasses are fogged up, they have like a vote like mask and they're like oh I'm, I'm commenting on this and anytime i see a mask coffee i'm like automatically i don't want to listen to this person uh they suck they're cringe they're a libtard uh get out of my mentions but this is the new normal i it'll be interesting if biden wins of how far they will go i have this feeling that if biden wins that people hate the mask so much and that a lot of this hysteria is just caused by being anti-trump that they'll eventually relent and they'll start be, they'll, there'll be articles in December claiming that now that COVID is just like the flu and we shouldn't worry about it anymore. And there'll be a return to normalcy in the summer. That's what I predict. I don't know how it will play out under Trump because they no longer have the motivation of hurting Trump in the election. So they'll just, I don't know what they'll do. They'll still have it as a signal of them saying that they're a good little uh, obedient student and they're unlike these evil conservatives who need a lesson on mass wearing. Yeah, I think they'll actually, I think they'll keep going with it. Um, it. They'll probably try to spin it as something like, oh, well, this is the, the baggage we had from uh, the last presidency from our evil Trump Nazi Fuhrer who... Uh, was did everything wrong now we got to fix it It was murdering yeah. people with COVID. It, yeah. it, it was all trump's fault that thousands of people died we had a real solution to it uh yeah. which was just wear masks even though everyone was wearing a mask this spring <laughs> yeah and it's that's how they kind of painted it is like you're literally a murderer if you don't wear the mask which is ridiculous i think they do help a little bit containing it but it's it's not that much it's really mostly to keep people from panicking yeah, and I think I think in certain situations, like if you're on a public transportation or an airplane or in your grocery store, if you're like in an inside place with a bunch of strangers and it's like packed and there's like areas where you get to translate, it's like for now, yeah, like wear the mask. That's fine. Uh, but if you're walking outside with a mask, like if that's uh, yeah, that's yeah. really stupid. Like, <laughs> like I bullied a friend who was walking his dog wearing a mask the other day. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the, listening uh, to uh, Justin Murphy was talking with Anakachian from Red Scare, and even like they were saying, like, yeah, the mess shit is cucked. Like, it's it's terrible. They'll still, they'll still. Once wear again, it, that's yeah. a good way to end. It's like the anti woke left. Maybe that we can form an alliance, an <laughs> anti mask alliance with the anti woke left of Justin Murphy and Anna Kachian. I'm actually probably saying her name wrong, but it's America, so she should. Uh, she should get an Anglo last name now that she's trying to be an American. So I'm going to pronounce it how I want to pronounce it, and, and it's my country. 
So sorry, Armenia. Figure out how to get real surnames. That's yeah. what I, I want to say about it. But yeah, that's like a good moment. I mean, yeah, maybe there are some issues we can unite over. Maybe masks are the one issue that anti woke left and us can unite on because they, at the end of the day, they hate these school marms and third grade teacher mentality that the left imbibes and constantly promotes. Uh, and they love this mentality of like, you know, Kamala Harris shaking her hand, her finger at, at American people like, I'm going to lock you up and you're going to. And that's what it is. And like these 50 year old spinsters are clapping along like seals. Like, yeah, the anti-woke left hates that and they want to oppose that. So, you know, maybe we can come together on opposing um, outrageous national mass mandates and stuff that really gives all the power to awfuls. So on that note, I think we're out of time today, but American Renaissance, Peter Griffin, tell the good people how to follow you. You want to follow me at Amren Peter, at A-M-R-E-N Peter. Thank you. And don't you have an Instagram as well? Uh, last time I left Twitter, I got rid of the Instagram, and I didn't realize uh. it was like, they deleted it after a week, and Twitter's like 30 days, so... I lost that one. Oh, man, that's too bad. Well, maybe we'll come back. Maybe we'll come back as uh, V. Dare Lois. So uh, maybe we can, <laughs> one can hope. But anyway, thanks for coming on the show again. We'll have to have you back. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It was a pleasure. And you're welcome. And until next time, stay respected.